Praise the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Bible study tonight. Thank you, Lord, because of the love and the interest you've given us in your word. That's the way it ought to be. Because we're your children, because we're citizens of the kingdom, we must be interested in the principles of the kingdom. Thank you, Lord, because of this deep love you've given us to study the word. We pray, Lord, greater love to obey your grant unto us in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, you grant us the key of understanding, the key of interpretation, and the key to be able to apply these words in every life in Jesus' name. That as a result of the study of the word, our families will become stable, will become spiritual, and will fulfill your will, and we will stay together in Jesus' name. We thank you because you've given us such a stable family in this church. And we don't have a family separating or coming apart or divorcing. Lord, we pray that this grace will be greater more and more in all the families in this church in Jesus' name. For those who are just joining us to study the word today in all the various locations, not only in Nigeria, not only in Africa, not only in Europe, not in America, everywhere, Lord, we pray that this word will do good in every life in Jesus' name. Keep us awake that you'll not be dozing and sleeping while teaching your word. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. A kind of amen that will wake up everybody. Thank you very much. God bless you. You can see now. Today we come back to Matthew chapter 5. You remember that last, uh, last Monday, uh, we, we studied once again the salt and the light in the new year. Just to remind ourselves that as we go on from verse to verse and from section to section of this wonderful sermon on the mount, you want to remember that this is a new year, a new time, and you want to retain the spirituality as well as the saltiness of the savor, the sweetness of the Christian life. That's why we went through that last week again, the salt and the light in the new year. We come back now to the flow of the series. We're looking at Matthew chapter 5. We're looking at verses 31 and 32. Matthew chapter 5, verse 31. It has been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, that is, except for the cause of fornication, causes her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committed adultery. Those are the two important verses we're looking at today. Very important, very essential. But you'll see how Jesus Christ started. Actually, he's been saying it this way. He would say, for, for example, what you knew before. And then he'll put some correction into what you knew before he'll say this is what you heard before and this is what you ought to know but i say unto you before i go on isn't it very important many of us before you came to a church like this you've been going to another church and you've learned a lot of things and we could also have said it was said by them of the other church of the other ministry, of the other assembly, of the other fellowship. This is what you learned before. That is before you came into the kingdom. Before you were born again. It has been said by your teachers, your Sunday school teachers, your theologians, your leaders and teachers, your prophets and pastors. It has been said by them of the old fellowship this this and that but now i say unto you that's why when you come here and you look at the word of god you say this is new this is different 
this is so distinguished and different from what I knew before. That's the way it ought to be because the darkness is gone and now the light is shining. And because of the shining of the light, shining on the word of God, you are hearing the gospel. And this is the true gospel. That's why Jesus Christ will tell the people, now you are coming to the kingdom. Now you are born again. Now you are citizen, citizens of the kingdom of God. This is what you knew before. It is not only that you have a change of heart, you must have a change of doctrine. A change of understanding. A change of teaching. This is the doctrine you had before. Old doctrine was the old life. Old doctrine was the old character. Old doctrine was the old heart. Now you are born again. Now you are converted. Now you are a different person. It is not only the person that is different. The doctrine must become different. The perception must become different. The lifestyle must become different. That's why he said over and over again. Chapter 5 verse 31. It has been said. That's what you knew before. Whosoever shall put away his wife. Let him give her a writing of divorcement. But now I say unto you. This is new. I pray God will give us understanding. Now you see. Those are people that were teaching the children of Israel. Why did they teach them what they taught them? Actually, as you look at the words of God and you trace the history of the children of Israel, you will find out why they were wrong and why their priests and their prophets and their pastors and their leaders and teachers, why they taught them the wrong thing. Look at Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 8. Jeremiah chapter 2. Reading from verse 8. Here is what... We learn. It says, The priest said not, Where is the Lord? And they that handle the law knew me not. That's the problem. The people that were teaching these fellows before Jesus Christ came, they didn't know the Lord. They didn't have a personal touch, a personal transformation, a personal relationship, a personal kind of fellowship with the Lord. They knew not the Lord. Are we not going to say the same thing today? In many places of worship, the people that handle the law, they know the Lord not. Not only that, Second Chronicles chapter 15. In Second Chronicles chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 3. Now for a long season, Israel had been without the true God and without a teaching priest. And without law. And that's the reason they got modeled up. That's the reason they got confused. That's the reason they were teaching them false doctrine. That's the reason when Jesus Christ came, he had to reteach them all over. And they needed to unlearn the things that they had learned. They needed to know that they, everything they learned before that time was wrong. Because it says for a long season, a long time, the children of Israel had no teaching priest. They had ceremonial priests that carried out rituals and ceremonies. But they didn't have priests that taught them according to the word of the Lord. Not only that, some other priests came up and they said, yes, we're teachers. We're going to teach. How did they teach? Micah chapter 3. In Micah chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 11. Micah chapter 3. Reading from verse 11. The heads thereof judge for the word. The priests thereof teach for hire. You see that? Eventually some teachers came. Some priests came. And he said, our job is to teach. And they hired them. And they had to dance to the tune of the people that paid them for their services. And it says, the priests teach for hire. The prophets thereof divine for money. And because of the love of money, they had to say what the people who paid them that amount of money wanted them to say. Otherwise, they will not have the money that they wanted to have. Because of that, they ended up teaching them just the ideologies of men. They told them what the people wanted to hear. Zephaniah chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 4. 
Zephaniah chapter 3, reading from verse 4. Her prophets are light and treacherous persons. Her priests have polluted the sanctuary. They have done violence to the law. They have done violence to the law. That is, they tear the law of God apart violently. They interpret and misinterpret. And those were the people that were teaching them before the Lord Jesus Christ came. And that continued till the end of the Old Testament. Look at the last book of the Old Testament. That is Malachi. Malachi chapter 2. Malachi chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 5. My covenant was, that's in the past tense, my covenant was with him of life and peace. And I gave them to him for the fear wherewith he feared me. That's still past tense. I was afraid before my name. And the experience was gone. The Lord was talking about them now. And it was all in past tense. In verse 6, the law of truth was in his mouth. Iniquity was not found in his leaves. He walked all in the past tense. He walked with me in peace and equity. And did turn many away from iniquity. For the priest's leaves should keep knowledge. And they should seek the law at his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But he had departed out of the way. This is the last book of the Old Testament. And the verdict concerning them. The priests... The prophets, together with all the people, is that they have departed out of the way. Ye have caused many to stumble at the law. They had misinterpreted the law of God so much that people did not have the right understanding and they stumbled at the law of God. Ye have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, have I also made you contemptible and base before all the people according as ye have not kept my ways but have been partial in the law have been partial in the law have been partial in the law what does that mean and what it means is whenever those priests saw that they themselves were guilty they'll just gloss over that area they didn't want to teach the totality of the word of god because they themselves saw that they were not living right and therefore they became partial in the law any area of the law where they knew that they were upright they were up to date up to the mark they'll teach it fervently any area where they saw ah, if i teach that it will come back to me like a boomerang and people will say but look at the priest himself then they'll be partial they will not teach that the last book of the old testament in dictating them judging them condemning them that they were not faithful to the law of god that's what jesus met when he came that's why in days someone on the mount yeah to them put everything straight that's why he repeatedly told them let's come back to matthew chapter 5 verse 31 it has been said whosoever shall put away his wife let him give her a writing of divorcement now you're asking yourself who are the people that said because said it has been said those people i read to you about the priests that were partial in the law the priest that didn't know God. The priest that were not faithful to the teaching of the word of God. The priests that misinterpreted the law of God. Those were the people that told them what he told them. Now Jesus Christ came and he said, we must put everything right. Because he came to talk about the kingdom. And if you're going to get into the kingdom, then we have to set the principles, the teaching, the doctrine of the kingdom right. That's why it says in verse 2, But I say unto you, what an authority and what an assurance. He said, But I say, I the Son of God, I the Word personified, I the authority said by the Father, I the greatest prophet and the greatest Lord that ever lived, but I say, unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife except for the cause of fornication causes her to commit adultery and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced 
also committed adultery. From what I've shown you in the word of God, you will know that moral values had disappeared in Israel by the time Jesus Christ came. Actually, the sanctity of marriage in particular had been trampled on the feet. At a time, separation and putting away, the wife became so common that it threatened the identity of that nation and the dignity of the nation. But now, the Lord Jesus wanted them to do the right thing. And because uh, we, they didn't understand, uh, they didn't understand why Moses had accepted and permitted them to put, uh, to put the, away their wives with the writing of divorcement. That is a bill of divorce. That is a contract that will show now everything is broken. If you come to Matthew chapter 19, Matthew chapter 19, you'll see the explanation that Jesus gave why they were allowed to do what they did for a time, not permanently for a time. Uh, Matthew chapter 19 verse 7, they say unto him, why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and put her away? He said unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart. It was not because that was the perfect will of God. Moses, because of the hardness of your heart. It wasn't because it was the original plan of the Almighty God. Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you, permitted you, allowed you to put away your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And why Jesus came is that he wanted to put away now the hardness of the heart you're asking but why will moses even permit them well they will do it anyhow you know those children of israel if you have read about them their hearts were so hard and their necks were so steep and once they said this is what i'm going to do that's exactly what they were going to do but then to slow down the process of divorce then it said you cannot just get up in a rage a burst of anger and say Get out of my house. I don't want you anymore. You have to go through a long process of seeking the writing of divorcement. And through that long process, the fellow might change. So that's why Moses eventually then set up that process. That all right, you say you have a problem. You want to put away that woman. You cannot do it immediately. You must go through a process. Through that process, then he slowed down what they were trying or they were bent to do. But now the Lord is saying, the Lord has cancelled that hardness of heart. And he now puts everything straight. That's why he says, but I say unto you. Let's learn now those verses of scripture in details. We're dividing the study tonight to three parts. Number one, the erroneous concept. And the perversion of marriage the erroneous concept and the perversion of marriage number two explicit command on the permanence of marriage explicit command on the permanence of marriage number three explanatory caution and the preservation of marriage let's come to number one erroneous concept and the perversion of marriage we're now in Matthew chapter 5, verse 31. It has been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give a writing of divorcement. It is very important, especially those of us who are teachers today, those of us who are preachers today, those of us who are leaders in the church today, those of us who are pastoring in the church today. You must know what the people who are coming to the church What they believed before they came And as you know what they believed before they came And you want to set them right now You'll be able to say brothers and sisters Who have just come to the kingdom of God This is what you knew before But nothing was wrong And you will show them in the word of God Why those things were wrong Then you will say now that you are in the kingdom in the new life, in the new relationship that you have with the Lord. Here is the word of 
God now because we must follow the Lord Jesus Christ in his pattern of ministry in his pattern of teaching in his pattern of instruction and training the people of God you see the method of Jesus here is what you knew in the past it was wrong and this is the reason it was wrong and here is what you need to know this is the right scene and this is the reason why it is right that's how to teach so that you erase the negative and then you plant the positive you you kick off you remove the thing that was wrong the thing that will not help the christian life the spiritual life of the people and then when you remove then you implant the right instruction that the people ought to know what was the erroneous concept the erroneous concept they had is that they could divorce their wives they could marry today and divorce tomorrow or they could marry this year and then divorce the following year it has been said that whosoever shall put away his wife let him give her a writing of divorcement that was the concept they had but christ made it clear and plain that he had not come to approve the permissive perverted ways of men he has not come to change the times and the laws that if anyone will change the times and the laws at all that will be the antichrist but why did they do what they did why did they teach what they taught why did they practice what they practiced why is it that marriage totally collapsed in their midst that you know they just married and then put her away marry another one put her away how did that happen why did that happen you need to understand that from the very time of moses the children of israel at that day's hardness of heart and the hardness of heart and the stiffness of the neck and the stubbornness of their will made them to refuse the perfect will and the perfect word of God. Let me show you their history from the time of Moses. That hardness of heart in Psalm 95. Psalm 95, I'm reading to you from verse 8. Psalm 95 verse 8. Handing not your heart as in the day of provocation. As in the day of temptation in the wilderness when your father tempted me and proved me and saw my work. Forty years long was I grieved with this generation and said it is a people that do err in their heart and I'm not known my ways. Can you see that? From the very time of Moses. Those 40 years in the wilderness, the Lord gave Moses the law. And then Moses gave them the law. But the hardness of heart will not allow them to keep to that word. In Jeremiah chapter 7 verse 25 verse 26. Jeremiah chapter 7 verse 25. Since the day that your fathers came forth out of the land of Egypt. That's the time of Moses, isn't it? Since the day that your fathers came forth out of the land of Egypt, unto this day I have even sent unto you all my servants the prophets, daily rising up early and sending them, yet they hearkened not unto me, nor inclined their ear, but hardened their necks. They did worse than their fathers. Can you see that? From the time of Moses, from the time they came out of the land of Egypt until the very time that Jeremiah was ministering to them. A long, long time. The Lord said they had not hearkened to the word of God and they had hardened their hearts. And it was because of that hardness of heart that was with them all through their history. That's the reason why they were kicking away their wives. They didn't understand. They thought it was a normal thing. Now in Matthew chapter 19, I'm reading from verse 8. Matthew chapter 19, reading from verse 8. It says unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. Uh, can I tell you something else now? You know, sometimes in a church here, as you look at the church, and then we go from verse to verse, 
from chapter to chapter from one book of the bible to the other and we say this is the word and this is what you do then you might come and you say but in other churches they permit them to do this and they permit them to do that yes we know that they permit them to do a lot of things in those other churches do you know why they permit them the hardness of heart in those places where they don't teach sanctification in those places where they don't teach the removal of the damnic nature in those places where they don't talk about the removal of the stony heart in those places where they don't understand the circumcision of the heart the hardness of the heart will be there and those pastors and shepherds and bishops and leaders will not know what to do with their members because the members will say this is what we're going to do and those people they don't have any choice they don't understand and because of the hardness of the heart the bishops and their pastors and their priests and their teachers and leaders may permit them to do those things then you come over here and then you hear the totality of the word of god that if any man be in christ is a new creature all things are passed away and behold all things have become new not only that that the very god of peace sanctify you holy that your whole spirit body and soul uh, be sanctified and then be blameless until the coming of the Lord and because the hardness of the heart is removed in sanctification we lay it plain before you and we say this is the word of God it's easy for us God gives us the grace to be obedient to the word because the hardness of the heart is gone so you cannot refer to that other church you cannot refer to that other fellowship you cannot refer to that other assembly and say but in that other assembly they permit them yes they permit them we don't permit them here because we deal with the hardness of heart and thank god he has taken hardness of heart away from us i said he has taken hardness of heart away from us and so we come to the lord with an open heart and with a willing spirit we say lord speak for your children are hearing you that's the reason we teach the totality of the word here look at ezekiel chapter 3 verse verse 7 ezekiel chapter 3 we're looking at verse 7 ezekiel 3 verse 7 but the house of israel will not hearken unto thee for they will not hearken unto me for all the house of israel are impudent and hard-hearted that's the reason they did what they did that's the reason they, they were permitted to just uh, just go ahead and uh, you're beginning to ask yourself but why will god permit them when he knew they were wrong it's like he permitted the children of Israel 40 years in the wilderness why would he permit them to keep on rearing children the children that will get to the promised land you know god is wise if he killed everybody in the wilderness which generation will get to the land of canaan and so you knew okay these ones have hardness of heart they are not going to get to the land of canaan they're going to do whatever they want to do in the wilderness but I remember my covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And I'm going to take the, children, the descendants of Abraham to the land. I will keep them alive. Yes, I know they have hardness of heart. Yes, I know that they have all this resistance to the word of God. But I'll keep them alive. So they'll keep on rearing children. And then their children will get to the land. When they produce those children that will inherit the land, then I'll get rid of them. That's how God did it. You don't want to have a hardness of heart like that and God to just keep you there. Just keep you there and say, okay, you rear children. You'll bring up converts. You'll bring up other people. The other people you bring will get into the land. It will use you to produce those children. But the hardness of heart will not allow you to get into the land. You don't want something like that. You want to give your heart to the Lord and say, Lord, I want to be among the generation that will enter into the land of Canaan but you can see for the children of Israel they had in their hearts and they couldn't make it eventually and they were told in Zechariah chapter 7 Zechariah chapter 7 we're looking at verse 12 Zechariah chapter 7 
And we're reading from verse 12. In Zechariah chapter 7, verse 12, yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone. It was, they did it themselves. They hardened their hearts. They trained themselves to be stony, stubborn, hardened. They made their hearts like an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts has said in his spirit by the former prophets. Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. Now you see the reason why they, they divorced their wives and it appeared that everybody was just doing that and Moses couldn't do anything about it. And the leaders that followed Moses could not do anything about it until the end of the Old Covenant, end of the Old Testament. They just kept on divorcing their wives. And now eventually Christ came and said, it's going to stop. The hardness of heart is going to be removed. The generation of hardened hearts has already gone. And now a new generation has come. And that new generation will have a heart of flesh. Now the Pharisees that were teaching in the synagogues, in the sanctuaries, in, in the temples. At the time of Jesus Christ, those Pharisees, they just followed after what they made. Because they themselves did not have experience of the Lord. Do you remember one of them, Nicodemus, came? And Jesus said, ye must be born again. And he said, how can a man be born again when he's old? He didn't have experience of the Lord, just like the other Pharisees. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, I die a ruler in Israel, a teacher, a leader in Israel. And you do not know this basic thing, ye must be born again. They were not born again. They need to understand. So they continued in what they made, in what they were teaching before. And now the Pharisees wanted everything to continue like that. They wanted license for their liberty. They wanted someone to put an approval, a stamp of approval to their perversion, to their error, to their evil. But Jesus said, no, God has not changed. That even in the Old Testament, God hated divorce. Look at Malachi chapter 2. Malachi chapter 2. We're looking at verse 14. Malachi chapter 2 verse 14. Yet you say, wherefore, because the Lord has been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously, yet she is thy companion and the wife of thy covenant you see that you have dealt with her treacherously and yet even in the old testament it says yet with all that you have done in spite of what you have done and in spite of your treacherous action against her she is yet she is still the wife thy companion the wife of thy covenant and he did not make one yet and in the residue of the spirit and wherefore one that he might seek a godly seed therefore take ye to your spirit and let none of you deal treacherously against the wife of his youth for the lord the god of israel says he hates putting away old testament even though they were doing it he hated putting away even though it appears moses permitted them he hated Watching away. Even though it was a common practice among them, because of the hardness of their heart, he hated putting away for one covered violence with his garment, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take it to your spirit that ye deal not treacherously. The Lord is warning every one of us then that we should not follow after what they had done, because the Lord actually hated what they did when it says he hates what he did uh, what whatever god hates is an abomination look at that in proverbs chapter 6 verse 16 proverbs chapter 6 verse 16 these six things does the lord hate yes seven an abomination unto him Whenever God says he hates something, that thing is an abomination to the Lord. God says, I hate putting away. Whatever I hate is an abomination. Now, if somebody does something that God hates, 
then that means that that thing that he has done is an abomination in the sight of the Lord. If that is true, that he has done that abomination in the sight of the Lord, uh, what's the end of that individual? Where will that person spend eternity? If he's doing what God hates, and therefore is abominable in the sight of God. Revelation chapter 21 verse 8. Revelation chapter 21 verse 8. But the fearful, unbelieving, and the abominable, and murderers, and all mongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which born with fire and brimstone. This, which is the second death. You understand the logic here? God hates putting away. Whatever God hates is an abomination. Therefore, putting away your wife, or quitting the home of your husband, your first husband, or your first wife, that's an abomination in the sight of God. If somebody dies in that abominable state, having left the husband, having left the wife, and marriage another god hates it and it's an abomination in the sight of the lord if somebody dies in that abominable stage the bible says it will spend eternity in the lake of fire but the person can repent while you're still alive and as you repent then you return to your first husband to your first wife and you say lord i'm sorry I quit that abominable stage. I quit that sin that you hate. I'm going back to the first husband. I'm going back to the first wife so that I will not remain in what you hate. I'll not remain in abomination so that if you die now after you have repented and you have made right your way and then if every other thing is right in your life, praise the Lord, you'll get to heaven. I said, praise the Lord, you'll get to heaven. The Lord is telling us then that we should correct that erroneous concept concerning marriage. I come to point number two, explicit command on the permanence of marriage. We're looking at Matthew chapter 5 verse 32. Matthew chapter 5. We're looking at verse 32. In Matthew chapter 5 verse 32 it says, But I say unto you, that's our Savior, that's our Lord, he never makes suggestion. Have you ever noticed when Jesus Christ taught, kings don't make suggestion. He spoke with authority. Here is the Lord of heaven and earth. Here is the word personified. And the Father has committed all judgment into his hand. And everybody will be judged on the final day by the word of Christ. The final judge. And that's why he has the authority to say, But I say unto you, That whosoever shall put away his wife, Save him for the cause of fornication, causes her to commit adultery. When you put away your wife, You expose her to adultery. When you put away your husband, You expose him to adultery. Because, you know, he's been living with you. And now, you have left the home. And the temptation will be there. And so, if he goes to commit adultery, yes, he's wrong. But to push him into it. That's what Jesus said. He said, whosoever, whosoever shall put away his wife, save him for the cause of fornication, causes her to commit adultery and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committed adultery and that means from what jesus christ said if you are living with a divorcee in the sight of the lord according to the teaching of christ the teaching by which we are going to be judged on the final day if you are now living with a divorcee a man or a woman you are living in adultery is there any remedy? Yes. To come out of that relationship. And then come for the grace of God. For the forgiveness and the cleansing of the blood of the Lamb. For restoration into the grace of God. For salvation in Christ. And as to say, Lord, I repent of my sin. I turn away from my sin. I give myself unto Christ. 
and then you turn away and you remove your hand and you remove everything your interest from that adulterous home then the lord will forgive you there'll be a change a change of your life a change of relationship a change of the place where you are and then the grace of god will forget the past now you'll be on your road on your way to heaven but as you look at this we have a fuller explanation in matthew chapter 19 verse 3 matthew chapter 19 i'm reading from verse 3 the pharisees also came unto him tempting him and saying unto him is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause those pharisees they came to ask questions sometimes they were not sincere in the asking the question sometimes they came to tempt him sometimes they wanted to just put a trap in his way sometimes they wanted him to give an answer that will make all his disciples to say uh, if it is the case if that's the case of a man with a wife with a woman then i cannot remain with christ they came tempting him but thank god whether they came to tempt him or not he always gave them the answer from the mind of god in the will of god the perfect word of god look at verse 4 and he answered and said unto them have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female one man one wife he said if you want to know the right answer if you want to know the perfect will of god go back to the beginning he made only one adam and made only one eve and when eve had eaten of the forbidden fruit and adam had eaten of the forbidden fruit a great offense the fall of man and both of them fell and they were driven out of the garden god did not make provision for divorce and remarriage because he did not create another woman go back to the beginning can you think of any other offense that a woman will commit greater than the one that eve committed can you think of any other sin that a woman will commit and influence the husband can you think of any other laws that a woman will make for the husband that the husband will say she has made me to lose my prosperity my business our house she made us to lose our children she made us to lose this or that can you think of any other laws that a woman can get a man into more greater than the laws that adam sustained with eve there's no other laws you can compare with being kicked out of the garden of eden and then losing the favor of god and yet there was no room for divorce and jesus said when you seek about the perfect will of god in marriage go back to the beginning because he said he which made them at the beginning made them male and female and said for this reason because of this shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and they twain shall be one flesh a man will leave his father and will leave his mother and then be joined unto his wife for life until death do them part wherefore they are no more twain but one flesh what therefore god has joined together let not man put asunder and jesus taught actually that would have been the end of the teaching the end of the instruction the permanence of marriage explicit command of christ on the permanence of marriage and look at the other one later but look at first corinthians chapter 7 first corinthians chapter 7 we're looking at verse 2 nevertheless to avoid fornication let every man have his own wife only one god makes provision for only one wife for every man and he doesn't make provision for you to divorce and get another woman again where are you going to get that from god makes only one for you and then for the woman it says and let every woman have her own husband and once you have got your own that's your own that's your own that's all that's all there's no other provision there's no extra 
and there's no provision for divorce and then pick another one again in fact even in the old testament look at deuteronomy chapter 22 deuteronomy chapter 22 those pharisees they never read the old testament very well in deuteronomy chapter 22 from verse 13 if any man take a wife and go in unto her and hate her and give occasions of speech against her and bring up an evil name upon her and say i took this woman and when i came to her i found her not a maid this this person is looking for a way to kick out the woman is looking for a way to divorce the woman and then he knew that the greatest sin he could say in the land of israel is that i didn't find her a maid a virgin look at what follows then shall the father of the damsel and her mother take and bring forth the tokens of the damsel's virginity unto the elders of the city in the gate and the damsel's father shall say unto the elders i gave my daughter unto this man to wife and he hated her and lo he has given occasions of speech against her saying i found not thy daughter a maid and yet these are the tokens of my daughter's virginity and they and they shall spread the clothes before the elders of the city and the elders of the city shall take the man and chastise him the elders of the city they will say you're a liar you wanted to kick away the woman and you're telling this big lie against your wife that you didn't meet her a virgin and now there is proof that she was a virgin when you took her and they will chastise him verse 19 and they shall immerse him in an hundred shekels of silver they'll find him after beating him and give them to the father of the damsel because he has brought up an evil name upon a virgin in israel and she shall be his wife he may not put her away all his days his old testament they were not allowed to do it to divorce they only just did it by force and they just did it because of the hardness of their heart i i pray the lord will help us to remain with the word of god once you are married you are married and if there's any problem in that marriage god will solve the problem in jesus name in romans chapter 7 i'm reading from verse 2 romans chapter 7 verse 2 for the woman which has an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth can you see that for the woman that has an husband is bound by the law by the law of god and that law of god was there before the law of moses from genesis chapter 2 for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and then be and join with his wife and they too the husband and the wife they too not three not four they too one man one woman the husband and the wife they'll cleave together they'll be one flesh what therefore god has joined together let no man put asunder for the woman which has an husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he liveth but if the husband be dead she is loose from the law of her husband it's only death that can break that union in verse 3 so then if while her husband leaveth she be married to another man she shall be called an adulteress while the husband is alive if she be married to another man she shall be called an adulteress what if she dies in that condition then she dies the death not of a believer but of an adulteress and if somebody dies in adultery he cannot see the face of god in heaven and while his wife is still alive if he be married to another woman he shall be called an adulterer and if he dies in that condition he dies as an adulterer and he cannot see the face of god he cannot get to heaven and there are only two places either heaven or hell and if a person doesn't get to heaven that means the fellow goes to hell and you know sometimes uh, there are some people that say i don't think i want to come to a church like this where they teach the whole bible 
Because if I know the truth, I'll be feeling guilty. I think what I'll do is I'll go to another church where they don't teach everything just like this. I'll go to another place where I'll have an easy conscience, a, you know, a peaceful conscience, and nobody will be reminding me that, you know, you've left your husband, you've left your wife, and therefore you're an adulterer, you're an adulteress. And then they go to another place. And then after some time, they are not hearing anymore. And they say, well, thank God now, I have peace. Even though they are living with another woman, another man, they say, now I have peace. Well, even if you close your eyes and your house is burning, and you're closing your eyes so the burning of the house doesn't mean that the house will not burn. Even if you don't read this passage of scripture, it's still in the Bible. That you are not hearing it anymore. And that you are now somewhere where they are not telling you the truth does not mean that it is concerned from the word of God. And that if you knew it before and now you don't know it because you have not had it for some time. And you are now in another place of fellowship that does not cancel the doctrine of the word of God. If you do something wrong, ignorantly, you will still be punished. I will show you in the word of God. But let me finish reading verse 3. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no more, she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. The question is, what if somebody does not know? What if somebody is going to a church where they never tell them? And he is saying, well, I never heard. And let's look at Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 47. Luke chapter 12 verse 47. And that servant which knew his Lord's will, and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. The servant that knew his Lord's will, and he delayed. He did not give himself to the obedience of the word of God. Here we're hearing the word of God. And you now know that to be the second wife, or the third wife, or to be in the home of a divorced man, or a divorced lady, you know now it's adultery. And if you remain in that situation, you now know the truth. If you died in that condition, it says, you'll be beaten with many stripes. That's not heaven. They don't beat people in heaven. It's only in hell. That's punishment. There's no punishment in heaven. It's only in hell. That's chastisement. There's no chastisement in heaven. That's in hell. We'll be beaten with many stripes. Look at verse 48. But he that knew not, uh -huh, those who have never heard, those who have never read, he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. They don't beat people with few stripes in heaven. That's hell. There are no few stripes. There's no small punishment in heaven. That's in hell. There's no moderate burning, moderate chastisement in heaven. That's in hell. Even the people that do not know, if they do things contrary to the will of God, the word of God, the punishment is still there. But thank God we know. I say thank God we know. Blessed are your ears for what they hear. And blessed are your eyes for what they see. Well, thank God we are in this church. I said, well, thank God we're in this church. Everything is clear. Everything is open. The people that were divorcing before, we now know why they were divorcing. Because of the hardness of their heart. And now the Lord said, I have come. He has removed the hardness of heart now. And there's no allowance for divorce anymore. Now, what if your wife has offended you? What if your husband has offended you? What are you supposed to do? Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, we're reading from verse 21. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 21, Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me? And I forgive him till seven times. Peter was born again, a child of God, a member of the kingdom of God. And he said, How many times will I forgive my brother? That's applicable to my sister. That's applicable to my wife. 
That's applicable to my husband. That's applicable to anyone, everyone. How often will my brother, my husband, my wife, my neighbor sin against me? And I forgive. Till seven times, Jesus says unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until... Tell me out loud. Seventy times seven. That's the commandment of the Lord. We just keep on forgiving and keep on forgiving because of heaven. And because of remaining in the kingdom of God, because of keeping our own forgiveness, what the Lord has done for us, we're looking at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. I'm reading to you from verse 30. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God whereby ye are sealed until the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Especially in the family now, we're considering the family. That in the family, although you, are, you have not divorced, you have not separated, how do you live together? In malice? Not talking together for some minutes, some moments, some days, some weeks, some months, some years. But the Lord is saying that husband and wife, parents and children in the family, and brothers and sisters too, in the family of God, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be ye kind one to another that's how to keep the family together do something kind to your husband do something kind to your wife every day that's how to glue yourselves together how to stay together and be ye kind one to another tender hearted tender hearted uh, you know, sometimes when we say tender hearted, you know, sometimes if you're a manager or a director in the place of work, you know, you give commands do this and do this and do that. In a place of work, maybe your, your profession allows that, your profession even demands that. But when you get to the home, you get to the house, you cannot deal with your wife the way you deal with them in the place of work. Things have to change. That's a family. There should be love and fellowship and unity. Concern, compassion and consideration. Maybe you're a woman. And in your place of work, you're on top. You're at the head of the organization. And you call the shots. And you're the one that says, do this. Do that. And they have to do it. If they want to keep their job, when you get to the home, you cannot do that to your husband. Tender hearted. That's how to keep the family. So that although we are not divorcing, we're not just enduring the marriage, we're enjoying the marriage. Be ye kind one to another. Tender hearted, forgiving one another. You might offend one another. If you are married, you understand. Some little, little things that happen. Some big, big things that may happen. The Lord did not say, if it's small offense, forgive. If it's a great offense, then retaliate. It says, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. We will do it. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. And you know, whatever the Lord will forgive, He wants you to forgive. He wants you to forgive. You know, there are people that will hammer on. We're coming to the third point now. They'll say, but you know, the woman has done this, has done that, which we're coming to it now. Point number three. It says, explanatory caution and the preservation of marriage. Explanatory caution and the preservation of marriage. We're coming to Matthew chapter 5, verse 32. Matthew chapter 5, we're looking at verse 32. But I say unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife, save him for the cause of fornication. Save him for the cause of fornication. Notice that language. That Jesus said, you must not put away your wife. Now, except for the cause of fornication. Let's look at Matthew chapter 19 verse 9. 
Matthew 19 verse 9 but I say and I say unto you the same language the same authority the same assurance in the tone in the statement but I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife except it be for fornication the same thing except it be for fornication and shall marry another committed adultery and whoso marries her which is put away does commit adultery this section of the of the sentence saving for the cause of fornication or except it be for fornication what does it mean what's fornication now you need to be a student of the bible when you talk about fornication alone by itself if fornication is standing alone by itself it means immorality of all kinds of all shape of all shades when it's standing alone by itself and so but when it is not standing alone and you have the same word adultery in that same sentence fornication and adultery in the same sentence then you are going to find out there's a limited meaning of that fornication and a limited meaning of that adultery before i come back to that let me explain it this way take the word man when you have the word man standing alone by itself it can mean mankind it can mean men and women look at the word of god in first corinthians chapter 10 verse 13 first corinthians chapter 10 we're looking at verse 13 there's no temptation taking you but such as is common to man but god is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above ye are able but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it you see the word man there there's no temptation taking you but such as is common to man that means common to mankind Come on to men and women. That's what man there stands for. Everybody, men and women. If you look at Luke chapter 9, verse 62. Luke chapter 9. We're looking at verse 62. Here it says, Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow, and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. That word man there refers to everybody Man and woman No man, no woman, no person No human being Having laid his hands on the plow Looking back His feet for the kingdom of God Now think about this When you have the two words Man and woman in the same verse Now the sense of the use of the word will change You will now restrict the man to the males alone it has a restricted meaning when those two words appear together in the same verse let me show you examples of that in first corinthians chapter 11 first corinthians chapter 11 the two words man and woman appearing together in the same verse chapter 11 verse 3 but i would have you know that the head of every man is christ and the head of the woman is the man and the head of christ is god you have man in that verse you have woman in that verse therefore you have to restrict the meaning of that man that man now cannot mean everybody on earth it has to be male has to be man look at verse 7 for a man indeed ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and the glory of god but the woman is the glory of man when you have the man and the woman in the same verse then you have to restrict the meaning of the man in first timothy chapter 5 verse 16 first timothy chapter 5 we're looking at verse 16 here you have another example if any man or woman that believeth have widows let them relieve them and let, the, let not the church be charged that it may relieve them that are widows indeed you have the man and the woman in that verse of scripture therefore the meaning of the man is restricted to the males the same thing with these words fornication and adultery 
when fornication and adultery both words when they appear in the same verse then that fornication is referring to what the man or the woman might have done before the marriage when they appear together in the same verse and let's look at this mark chapter 7 mark chapter 7 we're looking at verse 21 mark 7 verse 21 for from within out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts adulteries fornications murders the word fornication there will have to be restricted adulteries they are fornications and in that same verse adultery there will mean immorality between married people Fornication there will mean immorality between unmarried people. Welcome to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We're looking at verse 9. Know ye not that the righteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. No thieves, no covetous, no drunkards, no revilers, no extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. You see in that verse 9, you see fornicators apart, adulterers apart. That, that makes the fornication there to be immorality among unmarried people. And then the adultery there means immorality among married people. Look at another case in Galatians chapter 5 verse 19. Galatians chapter 5, reading from verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these? Adultery, fornication. Again, you have those two words in the same verse. So fornication then will take a restricted meaning. It's, it means then what they have done immorally before marriage. Come back to Matthew chapter 5. And you get the point of what we're making now, what we're saying. Matthew chapter 5, verse 32. But I say unto you, that two servants shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, cause her to commit adultery. Now, you see, those two words now appear in that verse. Therefore, fornication is referring to what had been done before marriage. The woman comes into the man, and then as they come together, the man discovered, you're not complete. You've done this before you came to me, before we got married. On that basis, the fellow may say, we're just getting started and see what I discovered. That's what I read you in Deuteronomy chapter 22. Where the man came and he said, I didn't find this lady, this my wife, a maid. Just coming together, look at this. And then they will see. And if it is true, then they will punish the woman. That's what Jesus is saying here. It is not after you have married for one year, two years, three years. And then the woman does something. Whatever she does after you have married, that's adultery. That's not fornication. And Jesus said, the only permission. It's not even a commandment. It doesn't say you must cast her away. It says, the only way you can be permitted not to even separate at all. You see, there has been fornication before the marriage. Of course, are you a Christian? If uh, you know that has happened or the woman has confessed that to you, you forgive. And if uh, you forgive, then you stay together. I pray God will give us the grace. Give me a good, good amen. amen. Look at John chapter 8 from verse 41. John chapter 8. We're reading from verse 41. John 8, 41. Ye do the deeds of your father. They said unto him, We be not born of fornication. Can you see that? When he said, You are children of your father. They said, What do you mean? We were born in the family. We be not born of fornication. Our mothers did not commit any sin before she, they came to our fathers. We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. And Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, ye would, have, ye would love me. 
for I proceed forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do ye not understand my speech? Even because ye cannot hear my word, ye of your father the devil. And the loss of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. For he is a liar and the father of each. What the Lord is telling us is that you should stay together. And suppose uh, then something a uh, sin had occurred, sin had happened. Well, if God is able to forgive, He'll give you the grace to forgive. Give me a good amen. amen. John chapter eight. John chapter eight. I'm reading from verse three. And the Pharisees and the, and the scribes brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very arch. Now Moses and the Lord commanded us that such shall be stoned. But what sayest thou? Can you see something here again? The hardness of heart is coming on them. They went for a woman, and this woman was taken in adultery. And they brought the woman to the Lord Jesus Christ. And with their hardness of heart, they came to say, Now, Jesus, we have a problem here for you. You must solve this one. We took this woman in the very act of adultery. What are you going to say? You know, it's like if, uh, you know, somebody came to you now and he said, uh, you know, this is his wife. And his wife, he has, uh, he has seen that his wife did this and that. What do you say? You know, there are people that will immediately go back. They don't understand. They go back to the Old Testament immediately. And they will say, this is what to do. But look at what Jesus did. This, they said, tempting him. They might have to accuse him. But Jesus stood now and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he had them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again, he stood down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. Many times there are people that will accuse other people. And when they accuse them like that, they'll be covering their own past lives. If they seem to know any little thing about the woman, about their wife, or they know a little about their husband, and then since that is what is known they'll be hammering on that but they themselves they have not been angels since they were born but they'll be saying look at what the woman has done look at what the woman has done but jesus christ he was writing on the ground and then they kept on troubling what do you say we have stones are out here we're ready to judge the woman she was taken in adultery. She cannot deny. Woman, didn't we catch you? And the woman could not talk. And then Jesus said, All right, there's so many stones on the ground. Those of you there, and he looked at their faces and he said, Those of you, anyone that doesn't have any sin, take the first stone and cast at her. Now we know them. One by one, they went away. They were guilty too. If the men are guilty, why are they talking so much about what the woman has done? Why don't you both go to the throne of grace and say, Lord, if thou will make iniquity, who shall stand? And then forgive your wife, forgive your husband, and let God forgive both of you. I pray the love of God will flow in our hearts. And then it says, when Jesus had lifted up himself, and saw none but the woman. He said unto her, Woman, where are those that accuse us? Has no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. 
the Lord will forgive. And if the Lord forgives, then we need to forgive one another. Husbands and wives, whatever has happened in the past, the past is gone. You have got the grace of God now. The Lord has forgiven you. Forgive one another and live the rest of your life in peace, purity, and pleasure. The Lord will bless you. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. And say, Lord, we're going to forgive and forget the past. We're going to forgive one another. Let the family stay together. Let the husbands and the wives stay together. Love one another. No malice, no anger, no wrath, no fighting, no strife, no contention, no conflict, no disagreement, no confrontation. Just loving one another. Talk to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, I commit myself to making sure that this marriage will stand. This family will stay together in fellowship, in love. Let you stay together. Let you stay together. You'll pray. And those of us who have not married... You need to be very prayerful in your choice. Very careful in your choice. Because that choice you make, that's the person you are going to live with forever and ever. That she is here on earth until death do you part. Are you willing to live with that person until death? Don't be so quick in making a choice. Don't be so careless in making a choice. Be prayerful and careful about it. Those of us who have married, let there be maturity at home. Stability of emotion. Offenses may occur. Difficulties may come. Challenges may come. The maturity and the stability of emotion to stay together for life. Until death do you part. Pray that all that childishness, all that immaturity, of almost threatening I will pack my load I will quit I will go I will, even if I'm going to stay alone I'll go that's immaturity develop the maturity and the stability of emotion so that you'll be able to keep that family together in the love of God and if you have offended one another the maturity to forgive the maturity to say the Lord has forgiven me I forgive you too I'm not an angel I've offended you before you are offending me now I forgive you too that maturity and stability of emotion to forgive and forget and then carry on in normal life loving relationship make it happen there should be commitment to continual transformation what do I need to change in my attitude, in my habit? To make my wife more convenient, happier, more stable, more joyful, more satisfied in the family. What kind of transformation do I need to make in my language, in my appearance, to make my husband enjoy the marriage more? To make him not just tolerate the marriage, but enjoy it. Not just endure it, but really love it. What change, what transformation do you need continually? Always be asking yourself the question. And then be making all the necessary changes and transformations. So that the marriage will be a blessed marriage, enjoyable marriage pleasurable marriage not something to endure something to enjoy develop the lifestyle of unselfishness the willingness to put the needs of your spouse first the willingness to make the needs of your husband first the willingness to make the needs of your wife first practice it on selfishness you wake up in the morning, Lord, what can I sacrifice for the joy of my wife today? What can I sacrifice? Give up. For the growth and development of my husband today. What can I do to make her feel happier? Make him feel happier. Make him feel contented. Joyful in the marriage. That's how to keep the family together. 
That's how to transform the doctrine into delight. That's not just, okay, the doctrine says we stay together. I have no choice. We have to be together. I will endure, Lord, give me grace. This is tough. No. Transform the doctrine into delight. The teaching into something that we take pleasure in by practicing unselfishness at home. What can you contribute to the marriage? To make the joy, the stability, the pleasure in the marriage make us want to stick together, stay together. Unselfishness in the marriage. Your spiritual consideration for one another. To help your partner to get to heaven. What can I do? To make it easier for my wife to get to heaven. What can I do? To make it easier for my husband to get to heaven. That's the purpose of staying together. Joining our hearts together. Our hands together. Our plans together. Our purposes together. And help one another to walk on this journey. This pilgrim journey going to heaven. Make it easier for one another to get to heaven. That's what we pray about. Lord, what can I do? Lord, how can I live? To make it easier for my wife to get to heaven. Lord, what can I do? To make it easier for my husband to get to heaven. It don't be a temptation to your husband getting to heaven. Don't be a stumbling block to your wife getting to heaven. Deny yourself. Come to spiritual maturity. Sacrifice. To help one another to be able to make it. Daily sacrifice of love. Daily labor of love. Daily patience of hope. You are patient with one another. On this pilgrim journey that leads us to the kingdom. Patience of hope. Whatever you see in your wife, you don't appreciate patience of hope. You are patient and you are hoping things will change. She will not be forever like that. Whatever you see in your husband, that you say this ought to change. Yes, it will change. Patience of hope. You are patient with one another. So that the grace of God will help him while you are praying the grace of God will help her while you are praying one for another and then you don't cut off the love just because of the things you don't appreciate let brotherly love continue let family love continue love one another as Christ also has loved the church that the husband will love the wife and that you love your wife as your own self for no man yet hates his own body but nourishes and cherishes it even as the Lord the church and so everyone in particular to love his wife and the wife see that she remembers her husband love one another Commit yourself to praying together, learning together, growing together. That's how to keep the family together. Not that one is growing bigger and the other one is growing smaller. Commit yourself to praying together. Commit yourself to learning together. Commit yourself to growing together. And commit yourself to providing the spiritual needs of one another. The physical needs of one another. And the emotional needs of one another. That's how to keep the family together. Abandon the old ideology. She offends me, she goes. That's the old ideology. 
He doesn't satisfy me. I will quit. That's the old ideology. You have heard it said. Whosoever will put away his wife, let him give by a right of divorcement. But I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever marries her that is put away, that is divorced, also committeth adultery. Wherefore, the man shall leave father and mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Wherefore, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. The Lord has taught us today is mind. Your marriage, stay together.